So the story starts, David is now in his royal leadership position. He's the king of all of Israel, has been for a little while. David has been very successful in conquering and defeating the enemies of Israel. In fact, here, the story tells us that Ammon, the house of Ammon, the nation of Ammon, the children of Ammon um, have been beat up, but that they've besieged Rabbah. It was technically David's responsibility to go as king and fight in these battles. But the Bible, when you see that last line in verse 1 of 2 Samuel 11, the but there is very important. You know what but actually means? But means, forget what I just said, what I'm about to say is what really matters. So when someone says, you know, you look good today, but what they really want you to know is what comes after. So the Bible wants you to know what comes after here. And it says, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. In other words, David was idle when he should have been active. Right? My Jamaican grandmother would say an idle mind is the devil's workshop. There's something dangerous about being idle. And part of the challenge facing our society today is many of our young people sit with, with more time then they have something to do. And so when that happens, trouble happens. And you're going to see that the devil has really de designed the world to really be able to take advantage of that. So one, David was idle. He was not doing what he was supposed to do as king. And one night, you can imagine he's bored. Now, he's got hundreds of wives and concubines. Let me, let me preface it with that. What's about to happen in the story is not a product of David being, you know, without. He goes up onto the roof of the, of the palace, and when he's on the roof of the palace, he's able to look across, and there he sees a woman bathing. Now, this is not, <laughs> this is not an average woman. There are very few women in the Bible that get the, the that get, um, a compliment on their beauty. She's one of them. It says, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. In other words, when David saw Bathsheba, like the old cartoons, his eyes popped out of his head. His tongue rolled out of his mouth and onto the floor. You ever see those cartoons when they see them? And they pop. David's heart rate increased. In fact, the reasoning centers of David's brain were instantly turned off. He was no longer thinking straight when he saw this woman in this condition. Now, this is not, message is not about modesty, but this is one of the reasons that we are asked as Christians to dress modestly because we don't know how we, we'll affect other people. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people are just twisted, and so it don't really matter what you wear. They're going to be twisted. I get that. But we, each of us, and it's not just women, because some men wearing some tight pants nowadays. I'll talk about that another time, you know. Everyone is supposed to dress modestly for this very reason, that humans, especially men, but even women, there is a powerful draw to what physically attracts you. And the devil wants to exploit that in each one of us. So... David stepped on a real rooftop, but nowadays we're stepping on digital rooftops. And from our cell phones, laptops, televisions, we can look over at the Bathsheba's bathing in the dark world that we live in. Watch this. This is a quote from, um, this is actually from the, the most popular pornography website in the world. It's called Pornhub. The pornography industry is being devastated by the fact that now people are posting these videos for free online. Listen to what they say. More people are watching porn on smartphones than ever. Pornhub, one of the biggest adult, adult websites, revealed, revealed. In its annual review of how people around the world watch porn, Pornhub claimed, Pornhub claimed that nearly 92 billion, billion with a B, 92 billion videos were watched over the course of of 23 billion visits to the site. I want you to see this. That's 64 million visits, visitors every day, or 44,000 every minute. 
That's insanity. Now watch this. It says, to put things in perspective, this accounts for around 4.6 billion hours of pornography watching. You live in a time, I live in a time, when very easily content can be sent down and people can get on the rooftop of their phone. In fact, this is, okay, so which country do you think is the worst with this? America. Well, y'all have to diss my country, huh? Well, y'all better take that back. Who's number two? All right, you guys hit, nailed it. Number one, by a, by a landslide, is the United States of America. Number two is the United Kingdom. Number three is Canada. All four, and India. All top four former British colonies. I wonder if that's a coincidence. Now, when you look at that, that tells you that this is, this is a big problem. But what you find as you go down is that you know, poor, there are less poor countries on this list, which makes sense. They, they're not going to, you poor, you're probably not going to waste your data on this. You know, you, <laughs> you probably need your data for something else. But this is where it's happening. So it's relevant to where I live and it's relevant to where you live. This is a major, major problem. And this is also from the Pornhub people. They, they put this out as where they, who goes onto their website. So let's talk about how pornography actually affects the brain. So the hypothalamus in the brain um, is affected by this. And I didn't put a lot of slides in. I didn't want to get too technical for this talk. But what happens is when you watch pornography, two things happen. Two dangerous things happen. Two very rewarding systems of your brain are triggered. The first one is, like any sexual activity, the dopaminergic pathways of your brain in the limbic system are stimulated. Now, what that means is that you actually get pleasure and euphoria from it. You understand what I'm saying? So the, without drugs or alcohol, the highest release of dopamine you can have as a human being is the dopamine released during sexual activity. That release, and that's why sex itself can be addicting. And as I'm going to talk about later in the week, I'm going to have a whole session for the young adults at noon on sex, a, t uh, a message called Why God Created Sex. So you don't want to miss that one. In fact, it's so good, I'm not even going to tell you when I'm going to do it. So you got to keep coming every day and try to figure out when I'm going to do it. When you have sex, God designed you so that as you look into the face of your husband or wife and the dopamine is released and oxytocin is released, there is a neurochemical bond between the husband and wife. Literally, with the pheromones that are released between the two people, the two become... One flesh. Satan realized, probably in the Garden of Eden, after he got Adam and Eve to sin, after he began to see them procreate, Satan realized that that system could be hijacked. This is how pornography entered the world. Now, pornography initially, of course, was live. If you read the Old Testament, what they would do is they'd bring in prostitutes when they worship Baal. That was pornography. They would be dancing and doing things while they worship Baal. It was a sensual, seductive thing. But Satan realizes that the more barriers it takes for you to get to pornographic material, the less likely you're going to do to get it, and the more difficult it will be to addict you. So eventually, people like Hugh Hefner, after um, the American psychologist um, Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey, I think his first name was Alfred, came out and pushed pornography as a normal way. Before that time, it was more a Victorian way of viewing sex and sexuality. There was a sexual revolution brewing. Kinsey was one of the leaders of it. Hugh Hefner, the famous Playboy mogul, was one of the students of it. And his role was to create Playboy to, in order that American men, and hence men around the world, would be more likely to want pornographic material, more sexual creatures, more likely then to start sex too early in life, have extra, extramarital affairs. It was, a, it was a, in my opinion, it was a strategy and a plan to bring down the family. They did not go after women first. They went after who first? If you can make men not faithful in their homes, you destroy homes. Are you getting this? And there's a whole neurochemical, neuroanatomical process through which this happens. That is in, in physical sex. Now, in pornography, what the devil does is he creates fantasy. And because the human mind is so powerful, it is the most 
sophisticated, uh, I want to say device, but it's not really a device, most sophisticated uh, 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 organ in our human body, but again, the most sophisticated device on the planet, if you call it a device. So when he adds fantasy to it, there is a thrill and a rush that you get that not just incorporates dopamine, it adds to it adrenaline, epinephrine, same thing. Same word for the same thing. So in other words, you get a rush of excitement around it. So you get hyped up. Now what that does is when you get the adrenaline rush, it turns off the prefrontal cortex of your brain. The part of your brain that actually helps you to make wise decisions. And it upticks, it creates more energy in places like the hypothalamus. So in other words, it's like lifting weights, I was reading on one article, and only working your biceps out. Your triceps are gonna be tiny, and your arm eventually is gonna look funny. You gotta work both sides of your arm, right? You ever see those guys lift weights and never do their legs? They look like a giant upside down weeble wobble, the old toy from the 70s, right? It happens in your brain. If you're overstimulating your brain on pornography, this part of your brain is more constantly turned off, but the lower parts of your brain are more constantly turned on, more often stimulated, and that, that, my friends, is the danger. Because what this, what, this, what, the, what, the, what this article says here is that the hypothalamus then begins to activate the testes in men to secrete more testosterone. SEM stands for sexually explicit material or pornography, crafts a brain that is constantly generating testosterone and heightens sexual desire. And that's the article that's taken from. Instead of allowing boys to focus on school, sports, and music, sexually explicit material causes a ramped up sex drive where, the, where their minds are inundated with sexual thoughts. Now here's what's crazy. The devil just is looking for a way to distract. So when these boys and girls, I was doing a purity retreat in South Florida. Oh, uh, well, it was not in South Florida, it was in like North Florida, but most of the people came from South Florida. And I, we, we did a session on this, and we were talking about pornography at this purity retreat, mostly teenagers, up to, people up to about 25 years of age. And when we did the call, we did a call for people to give up pornography. And young men jumped up and started coming down that they needed to give up pornography. Guess who else jumped up and ran down? A whole lot of girls. The study showed that up to thir a third of the pornography users in some places can be girls. So they came running down and everybody had issues with this. Some people do it because of boredom. Some people do it because they've been... They've been traumatized themselves and somehow they connect back to it as they were, and I'm just talking about what they were explaining to us. Some of them, their friends told them that they should be doing it. All kinds of reasons came out. But the point is, it will make you focus on sex unnaturally, constantly, right? And it, that then is going to have consequences later on. And of course, if, you're, if you start releasing too much testosterone, it becomes more difficult to focus on schoolwork. But what happens to boys when they are in a heightened state of of testosterone, they have too much testosterone. What else do they become? Aggressive. They're more likely to be violent. And so there's other side effects of this that I won't even get into today. God designed, you know what a boy, a 15 year old boy should really be worried about? School, church, and football. I have uncles that were like, yeah, when they were growing up, they didn't even think about girls until they were 14, 15 years old. That's when they started having crushes. Before that, all that mattered was playing sports. That's not the way it is anymore. And I'm going to show you why it's so different now. So research has long established that teens who watch movies or listen to music that glamorizes drinking, drug, drug use, or violence tend to engage in those behaviors themselves. A 2012 study shows that movies influence teen sexual attitudes and behaviors as well. Look at this line. The study published in Psychological Science, not a Christian journal, found that the more teens were exposed to sexual content in movies, the earlier they started having sex and the likelier they were to have casual, unprotected sex. Did you get that? Now that's not a, remember, this not, no, this not AY at one of our churches. This is a journal, Psychological Science, that the writers and editors probably don't believe in God at all. Yet they're saying 
What they're saying in this article is, if you watch movies, and in the movie there's heavy sexual scenes, and you're a 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old, when you watch it, it literally affects the way you will act out later on sexually. Did you, are you seeing this? I remember there was one nurse where I was working, and she had two little girls, six and like three or something like that, or five and three, and they went and saw a movie with heavy sexual content. She was telling us at the nurse's station how she took her daughters. Away. Everybody in the room gasped. How could you take your kids to see that? And then what's crazy is she says, "Well, I covered their ears through the, I covered their eyes through the parts. You covered their what?" I want you to get that when the spirit of prophecy says, by beholding, we become changed, you do. Now, here's what's crazy. If that's rated R movies, what influence do X-rated movies have? Are you getting what I'm saying? X-rated movies are the crack cocaine of the entertainment industry. They become addicting, and that's why this happens. And most parents don't realize what their kids are watching. I'll get to that in a second. So here, this, this quote here, porn is practically ubiquitous. Says Anna Bridges, PhD, a psychologist at the University of Arkansas. And the internet has made it easier than ever to get an erotic fix. The late sex researcher Alvin Cooper, PhD, called this a triple A engine effect. I want you to see this. Here are the three reasons pornography is so readily available today. It's accessibility, you can get it on your phone. Affordability, it is now free. And anonymity, you can do it and nobody knows that's what you're doing. You get that? Let me tell you something about sin. Sin advances, it thrives in secrecy. Right? As we're going to see in the story of David. Sin thrives in secret. If you're doing anything that you want to hide from people and do, it's probably because you're sinning. I remember one time I was walking, I'd, I'd walk in California, I would walk from my office at lunchtime over to a healthy, like a, there's a healthy like grocery store and buy a salad and I'd walk back. And one day as I was walking back, there was a girl, probably weighed about 400 pounds, literally, sitting in the car by herself, sobbing, and next to her were bags of McDonald's. And she was just stuffing hamburgers and french fries in her mouth as she wept and cried. And, and, and where I live in Calvary, it was hot, all by herself. And I did not see her as obese or greedy or gluttonous. I saw her as broken. When you hide to drink alcohol, hide to eat food, hide to watch pornography, it is because sin loves darkness. It wants to hide. And because your children, when you have kids, when you guys aren't mothers and you don't have kids yet, when you have kids and they get of age, the reason they, they, you got to watch what they have on their cell phones and you got to watch what's on your own, because if I can hide in my room, I can watch and do anything in secrecy. Those are the three A's, accessibility, affordability, and anonymity. Preliminary analysts of data from a 2016 Indiana University survey of more than 600 pairs of children and their parents reveal a parental naivety gap. Did I say that right? I don't speak French. I guess I did. Somebody corrected me. Half as many parents through their 14, uh, thought their 14 and 18-year-olds had seen porn as had, in fact, watched it. Did you get that? When they poll the parents and the kids, the parents think, my child would never watch pornography. But half the kids, in fact, had already watched pornography. Now watch this. And depending on the sex act, parents underestimated what their kids saw by as much as 10 times. Most of us as parents think we know what our kids are doing. I, 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 when I was in Holland, I went and saw um, the Anne Frank house. I love that book. I read that book in school. And one of the things her father says when you go to the house uh, um, in Amsterdam, it is a, there's a placard, I believe, on the wall. And he says what he was sh most shocking to the father when he read her diary is how little he knew his daughter. He, she didn't, he had no idea she was having a crush on a boy. She, he had no idea of all that stuff. Most parents don't know what their kids are capable of or what they're into. And I mean, that's, in a sense, it's partly part of life. But in, in another way, there's something you got to watch. So what are some of the signs 
of pornography addiction. Now, the medical community, psychological, psychiatric community, has not come to the conclusion that there's a real porn um, DSM-5, uh, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, that is how we determine what is a psychological disease or not. They have not come to the conclusion that pornography is a, addiction really exists. But here's what the experts say. So let's just go through these real quick. Being, un being unable to stop using porn or stop engaging in behaviors associated with porn despite repeated, repeated attempts to do so. Experiencing cravings to view porn, second bullet, much like substance users report feeling strong urges to use drugs, porn addicts can experience strong urges to view porn. Number three, becoming angry, hostile, or irritable when asked to stop using porn. Porn addicts may deny their porn viewing or be upset when loved ones request that they stop. Keeping all or part of one's porn use secret from loved ones, right? And the second sentence in that first bullet there says, porn addiction has been shown to lead to increased secrecy in relationships. Now, what happens in a relationship when there's increased secrecy? You begin to fall apart. Almost by definition, if you're hiding someone from your spouse, it starts to fall apart. And I had a patient once, a female, who was hiding her porn addiction from her husband. And she, was, she, she, she actually came to see me because by then she'd had a rip-roaring sexually transmitted disease. Horrible. One that she would never get rid of. And she came to see me with her husband. It turns out she went from a, watching porn at her home while her husband slept to eventually, this crazy woman went on Craigslist. They have Craigslist over here? So Craigslist is like, it's like ghetto eBay. It's, it's, um, it's like cheap and free and you can, I don't know how else to describe it. It's, it's, but it's like a free, like, you know, you can go on there and buy any, all kinds of stuff, rent houses, rent apartments. And she went on there and found a man to ha have an affair with. I said, you are crazy. He could have been a serial killer. Uh, you know who you, I mean, you just met a man on Craigslist blindly, had an affair with him, and of course she got a bunch of diseases. All started with porn. And the secrecy separated that. Of course, her husband was crushed, devastated. They had kids. It was a very long, very difficult situation. But that is what it does. Secrecy destroys marriages. Continuing to view porn despite negative consequences, such as broken relationships or job loss, Relationships where one partner is addicted to porn can lead to reduction in intimacy, emotional distance, reduced sexual satisfaction, and overall poor quality of relationship. Being unable to abstain from porn during work hours can lead to disciplinary action or even job loss. There are people who lose their job because they can't watch, stop watching this stuff. And what happens to a man? Here's what happens, and I don't know if I really get into it deep anywhere else, so I'll say it now. One of the things that happens to a man is that when he's watching all of this pornography and there's so, so much fantasy involved in it, his wife can't satisfy him anymore because there's no fantasy at home. It's reality. It's bills, it's children, dishes to wash, food to cook, grass to cut. You get what I'm saying? There's no fantasy to it. And it's the same woman, and there's no, all of the, 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 the exotic nature of what they do and the multiple partners and this type of stuff doesn't exist at home. So their wife can't get, watch this, can't get enough of an adrenaline release in them to stimulate them. So they have no sex drive for their wife. That's what happens to a lot of men. We'll talk more about that in a second. Other signs that you become, of porn addiction, losing track of large chunks of time due to being absorbed in porn. Porn addicts may spend much of the day viewing pornography. This can lead to porn becoming a priority with everything else set aside in favor of viewing porn. The last one is this one. Requiring increasing amounts, of, amounts or more explicit porn to gain the same satisfaction or thrill, similar to the development of tolerance. So what happens to drug addicts is the more you use cocaine, how much more, do you need more cocaine if, as you use cocaine? Absolutely, because your body, fearfully and wonderfully made, the D2, dopamine 2 receptors on the postsynaptic nerve of your brain begin to downregulate because they're being overstimulated by dopamine. 
So your body trying to protect you begins to turn down dopamine receptors, which makes it more difficult for you to feel pleasure. This is why when you give rats cocaine, eventually they starve to set themselves to death just wanting the cocaine. Because they want more and more and more of the euphoria, more and more and more of the pleasure. It's the same thing that happens. Tolerance is developed with, with heroin, with nicotine, with all of the drugs of abuse. Caffeine. Pornography is the same. So after a while, just watching a normal sexual scene on a screen isn't enough. Eventually it has to get violent. Eventually it has to get other crazy things involved. And they have to keep ramping up and it has to get more and more sadistic, more and more involved, more and more time watching it, more and more depth to it until you become more and more and more trapped in it. And this is what ends up happening. They don't talk about this, but a growing number of young men are convinced that their physical in-person sexual responses have been sabotaged because their brains were virtually marinated in pornography when they were adolescents. Their generation has consumed explicit content in quantities and varieties never before possible on devices designed to deliver content swiftly and privately. All at an age when their brains were more plastic, more prone to permanent change than in later life. These young men feel like unwitting guinea pigs in a largely unmonitored decade-long experiment in sexual conditioning. There is a backlash in the United States, and I went online last night, it's also in the United Kingdom, but more so in the United States, of young men, not Christians, who are saying, pornography destroyed my life. They're saying, I can't have a normal marriage with a woman because when I was 13, 14, 15, 18, 20, I was so busy watching pornography that no woman can do what pornography did. And because your brain does not finish developing until you're 25, they've marinated their minds when it is most malleable in this stuff. So later on, they're never happy with a woman. And the devil has won, hasn't he? Not only are you addicted to this stuff, you'll never have a slice of heaven as, as God wanted the marriage union to be. So he didn't just poison you as a teenager, he poisoned you for life. That's how destructive pornography. So powerful, not only are young men doing this, the feminists are coming out. Do you know one of the major reasons now for sex trafficking is around pornography? So if people say, well, if I watch porn, it doesn't hurt anybody else, read the accounts of porn stars who come out and say how they were beaten, raped, drugged, abused, all in the United States, probably over here in Europe as well. This is not a victimless uh, crime. It's not, and it's not a crime. It's, well, some countries it probably is. It's not a victimless act. Watching pornography means someone on the other side of the camera had to go through that stuff. And some people say, well, that's the best job in the world until your spirit is ripped out of you with it. We'll talk about this when we talk about sex later in the week. But every time you sleep with someone, you leave a piece of yourself on that person, and they leave a piece of them on you. When you sleep with hundreds and hundreds of people, your body, your spirit, your, your, your parts of you just become mingled and messed up with all kinds of folk. That's not easy to shake. There's some famous people who have come out and talked about this. You guys probably know him. That's Terry Crews. He's um, a National Football League player, and um, he's on Brooklyn 99 um, sitcom. He's also the host of America's, or like the, the, I don't know, the guy behind the stage <laughs> and on America's Got Talent. In fact, I was at the gym once in Los Angeles, and um, I was on the treadmill or on the elliptical, and I looked over, and this guy is really ripped up, cut up dude. He's over on the treadmill about seven ticks down, he's on it just, just running, 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 running. So he, he practices, you know, he's an active dude, but this is what he says about pornography. He says, pornography changes the way you think about people. People become objects. People become body parts. They become things to be used rather than people to be loved. Pornography is an intimacy killer, he says. It kills all intimacy. Every time I watched it, I was walled off. It's like another brick that came between me and my wife. I didn't want to be this way. I didn't want to continue to do the things that hurt my wife, that hurt my family. These are the words of Terry Crews, a former NFL football player, sitcom actor. He's a Christian, husband and a father. 
In his autobiography, Manhood, How to Be a Better Man or Just Live with One, he shares his battle with pornography addiction, the difficulties it created in his marriage, and how rehabilitation helped him to overcome. So here's a celebrity that came out and said, listen, pornography was ruining my marriage and my life. A Christian. And he was bold enough to step up and say and do something about it to try and help other people. Pornography is a powerful thing. It, like he said, it builds bricks between you and other people, especially between uh, him and his wife. And see what he had to do? He had to actually go to, there are now rehab programs. Some people say, well, all these rehab programs are a farce. Some people actually are going to need to be pulled away and given techniques as to how to avoid this stuff because it is that damaging. You guys probably know him. This is Russell Brand. Um, he's, he's British, and he's a famous guy. And here's what he says. He says, I know that pornography is wrong. Now, I don't think he's a Christian at all. I shouldn't be looking at it. There's a general feeling, isn't there, in your core, if you look at pornography, that, uh, that this isn't what's, best, what's the best thing for me to do. I feel like if I had total dominion over myself, I would never look at pornography again. One day at a time, I would kick it out of my life. This whole cloud of pornographic information and even soft cultural smog, interesting term, is making it impossible for us to relate to our own sexuality, our own, sexual, our own psychology. And that's from the website Fight the New Drug, where they talk about pornography as the new drug. Russell Brand, an exuberant actor and comedian, has faced job losses and relationship issues due to his early use of and addiction to pornography. The video which he expresses uh, expresses his difficulty with pornography was originally entitled has, po has porn ruined my chance at a happy marriage his responses within the video suggest that pornography use has deeply affected his ability to have the kind of meaningful relationships he desires he says if we feel constantly bombarded with great waves of filth it's really difficult to remain connected to truth I don't think Russell Brand is a Christian but that is a powerful powerful statement powerful statement he is I mean he's speaking some heavy stuff here who was he married to you guys remember Katy Perry also a former Christian I don't know if y'all know that but Katy Perry used to sing all kind of Christian songs and wanted to be a Christian he says that his marriage and I don't know if it's that particular marriage I don't know if he's been married more than once he's lost marriages jobs he's an actor and lost jobs because he couldn't stop watching pornography isn't that crazy but he says at the end here, if we feel constantly bombarded with great waves of filth, it's really difficult to remain connected to truth. And he doesn't know this because he's not a theologian, but what he's really saying is very biblical. Sin separates us from God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you're constantly being bathed in sinful material, how do you connect to God? Because guess what happens after that? Now you start feeling shame, guilt. You know, shame and guilt are two of the devil's greatest weapons. The Bible says he's the, he's, Satan means adversary. He's the accuser of the brethren. So he wants to addict you to sin. We'll talk more about this later in the week too. He wants to addict you to sin, like pornography, and then he wants to turn around and tell you, you know what, you're so terrible because you do this pornography that God will never accept you. That's how the devil works. He hits you on both sides of the sin. Because he knows that even though you've done you, you may have watched hundreds of hours of pornography. He knows that the blood of Jesus Christ can wash you clean. But he traps you in sin by convincing you that you sin too long and too much for God to forgive you. Pornography is even moving into video games. I won't talk about this much. But I saw this online, and this is a, a scene in a video game where there's like a violent sexual encounter at the crop and cut. Just to show the face, this is the, so imagine when I, so that, this is interactive. Can you imagine, and I know the, the most, one of the most famous video games is um, Grand Theft Auto. Well, they're probably up to number six or seven now, I don't know what number they're on. And in that, they have scenes where the kids can actually go into strip clubs and all of this kind of stuff. That's, that's crazy. No one knows how that affects your brain, interactively like that. Ellen White says it like this. She says, Man is contending with foes who are stronger than he. 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spirits, against wicked spirits in high places, Ephesians 6, 12. She says it is impossible for us in our own strength to maintain the conflict. And whatever diverts the mind from God, whatever leads to self-exaltation or to self-dependence is surely preparing the way for our overthrow. The tenor of the Bible is to inculcate distrust of human power and to encourage trust in divine power. Here's what happens when you become a porn addict, like most other things that sins that you get trapped to, you become dependent on yourself to escape this world for pleasure. And in that process of self-dependence, by default, you stop depending on God. And in the process of not depending on God, you set yourself up for eternal failure. Let's finish up the story, and then maybe we'll have a few minutes for questions. 2 Samuel 11, verse 3 says, And David sent and inquired after the woman. So David had messed with Bathsheba, and he went and said, Hey, how you doing? And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? If I had time, I'd go into the fact that both of these men, she's the daughter of Eliam, who was one of David's most pro profound advisors, and she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, as you know, one of his greatest soldiers. David didn't just mess with any woman. He literally messed with a woman that was like supposed to be family to him in a way. Her father and husband were his Homeboys, he was tight with both of them. He trusted both of them. That's how foul David went on this one. And David sent a message and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanliness. That's why she was on the roof bathing. And she returned unto her house. Look at verse 5. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Uh, most men, if you ain't in the right situation, those four are sort of four of the scariest words you'll ever hear in your life. You fool around on, on Tinder and hook up with somebody and two weeks later you get a, or a month later or six weeks or three months later, oh, I am with child. You don't know what to do. You without a job, without a clue, without a thought. Sin, listen to me, sin has consequences. What the world wants to do is to, sh is to hide the consequences of sin. It wants to block them so that sin does not seem sinful. They want babies aborted. They want diseases treated. They want um, a birth control ubiquitous. And, it, and I'm not saying any, any of those things are bad or good. I'm just saying what happens is the devil wants it so that when you sin, you don't ever feel the consequences of your sin. So that you don't realize the sinfulness of sin. We'll, hit, we'll, go, we'll finish up on sex later on, maybe talk with Bob David a little more. I want to give you this quote, sin fascinates before it assassinates. Sin fascinates before it assassinates. And I'll ask you the question on the last slide here. What are you doing on your rooftop? What are you doing on your rooftop? And would God be pleased with what you're doing on your rooftop or in secrecy. Now, I don't know if I really want to ask questions or not. I'm debating that right now. I answer questions. Because a part of me just wants to say, listen, let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Let's have every individual just call out to God on whatever sin it is that is easily besetting them. Now, it may not be this one. But this one is a great blueprint for any sin that captures you. And I think that's the way we'll go. Bow your, bow your heads, close your eyes. And I want you to just take about 30, 40 seconds, and I want you to ask God, first of all, to show you what it is in your life that you need to let go of. What sin is there in your life that is manipulating you, controlling you, causing you to fight and war against the God who loves you? What sin is in your life that is causing you to crucify Jesus Christ afresh every day. Some of us every hour. Some every minute. And I want you to ask God to identify those sins. And then I, wanna, I want you to not ask God to simply remove the sin from you. That's not enough. I've talked to people who've come out of great sin and they say, you know what? I couldn't come out of it just asking God to take it away. 
I had to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ that displaced my desire for the sin. That's why the old hymn says, to turn your eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will do what? Grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I want you to ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit and to drive you into a relationship with Jesus and out of a relationship with whatever is binding you. And all of us have something that's binding us. I'm going to wait 30 seconds while you pray. I'm going to close out and then we'll have about five minutes for questions. All right, we have a quarter of this clock here, about five minutes and 40-something seconds. Does anybody have any questions? If you don't have questions, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> but in case somebody wants to, has a question, I'll answer any question you might have um, on this subject or even maybe on something else. Um, I, am, I think uh, Pastor Ramden is over there. I think we're going to just do my testimony on Sabbath, Divine Hour here. Um, I, I, I looked at the schedule. I can't figure it out any other time. So you can let everybody know. That I'll be doing it here on Divine, uh, Divine Hour. Now that is an excellent question. That is the million-dollar question. So how do we, how do, so let's say you have someone who's not a Christian friend maybe, and they're very heavily into pornography. How do you talk to them about this? Well, one of the things I would do is use non Unlike other sins, there are many non-secular. And here's the funny thing. Christians and secular feminists are united against pornography. People realize the damaging effect this has. Women are objectified and controlled. Like I was saying, I could, maybe later on in the week I'll tell you the story of a, of a college student in the States that was sexually trafficked. A wealthy African-American young lady from a good family in L.A. Sex trafficked inside the United States around some of this kind of stuff. So one of the things is I would show them from a social kind of social justice standpoint that in fact what you're involved with does have victims, number one. Number two, it is not harmless. It will affect you. And I would quote people like Russell Brand and, 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 and um, Terry Crews and others. And there's a whole movement in the United States of men who are coming out and saying, listen, pornography has ruined me. I am sexually distorted. I cannot have a normal sexual relation with a woman, right? And we'll talk about sex later on and why self-pleasing before you're married is so dangerous for your marriage, right? But, so those are, the, those are probably the main two things. I would then, add, I mean, I would then begin to ask questions like all of those signs of, 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 of addiction. I would ask, how much time do you use? Does it ever have negative consequences, right? Are you watching so much pornography and you're in college that you're not doing your homework? You know, you say, you guys say university. You're in university and you're not doing your homework. Are you watching so much pornography you can't keep a job? Right? Are you spending lots of money, time on this thing? Is it all absorbing? And so I would ask those kind of questions and see what they say. I'll, you got to remember, when people are in an addiction, it's blinding. Like I said at the beginning, the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobe of the brain, the reasoning centers are switched off in addiction. That's why a, co a crack addicted mother will allow her children to run out into the street and play. All that matters is the next fix. And so, you know, you got to just reach them with that. But let me tell you the most powerful thing I've learned about how to impact my friends and family who I want to move towards Christ. You know what it is? Prayer. I have learned that if you pray, you can invite God into someone else's situation even when they may not be praying for God to come in. Because the devil will say to God, you can't help this person because they are not given over to you you have no permission to come into their lives. And you can stand in the gap as a friend and pray and ask God into that person's life. In essence, quote unquote, giving God permission to go where the devil says he can't go. 
You can stand in prayer. That's what the Bible says. The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man does what? It avails much. So that's the other thing I would say. Pray. You should have a prayer list of people you're praying for to try and move towards an end, a, you know, to get them to somewhere so that they are closer to Christ. And you should have people who are praying for you. Amen? Amen. That ends our session. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this time this morning to deal with this very difficult um, and challenging subject, but one necessary for the church to address. Father God, there are people under the sound of my voice who are addicted to pornography. And I pray, Lord, that you would show them that they can be set free, that you came to set the captives free. And Father God, if they would pray not just to come out of the addiction, but pray for the Holy Spirit, for its power to live in them, to be active in them. If they will study your word and call on your name in prayer. And Lord, most importantly, in order to gain victory over sin, it's not to stare at the sin and think about the sin. It's to turn our eyes to Jesus, to think on him, on his crucifixion, on his resurrection, on what he's doing for us now in the heavenly sanctuary. It is to turn our hearts and minds towards you. Then the things of this world will grow strangely dim, including pornography and sexual addictions. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.